fearless building. Wes, can I have you take this? Thank you. If you have a Bible, actually, we're looking at the book of uh, Haggai. Haggai. You go, man, where is that? It's <laughs> find the be- end of the Old Testament, and then it's just a couple chapters in. That would be the easiest way to find it for you. Haggai, we've been talking about Nehemiah. Actually, we're wrapping up the series this morning of Nehemiah building Jerusalem, rebuilding the walls. And the idea behind rebuilding the walls isn't just so there'd be a city, but there'd be a place that people could encounter Jesus Christ. And that's what we're relating today, that our lives would just be a place where people can encounter Jesus, because Jesus is going to visit Jerusalem. It's going to be about 400 years from now, but still, he's going to visit Jerusalem, and he needs a city. And he's going to go to Jerusalem, he's going to die and pave the way for us to know Jesus Christ. One thing, if you read Nehemiah, which I hope you have over this series, there's this emotional roller coaster going on in Nehemiah's life. And some of the emotions, I don't know. I, if you've been here for a while, you know I like to put myself in there, how I would feel. But in some areas, I don't know how I'd feel. Because Nehemiah, we don't know how old he was when he stepped into this job. But before that, he was a slave. And he just happened to have a very cushy slave job of eating food before the king ate his food. So how can you imagine the food was pretty good? Because it served for the king. So, and I don't know where the emotion was there, but then the story goes on that his brother came and told him that Jerusalem was destroyed, and he, some of these, we, we talked on some of these his sermons, he went into anguish, he went into a great grieving process for a couple of months, and then the king, Eretaxerxes, asked, why are you grieving? And he just, the king just made a decree that he doesn't want Jerusalem to be rebuilt. And Nehemiah's crying because he wants to rebuild Jerusalem. And so the king says, why are you crying? And the next emotion, so he, we don't know how he is. He's grieving. And then terror and fear fill his life. Like, what's the guy going to say when I say I want to rebuild Jerusalem? And then the king says, go ahead, rebuild it. So relief goes into his life. And then uh, he goes there and sees how the walls are totally torn down, and this determination comes into his life. And then the people are enthusiastic when he says, we're going to do it, and everybody's excited, and they start building because we can all start really well. But then the enemy shows up, and fear comes into their life, and the Bible says discouragement comes in. And then he says, Nehemiah, man, we need to step back and remember Our God is great and glorious, so, you know, we we can do this again. Do you see the emotional roller coaster that this guy's going through from fear to anguish to joy to enthusiasm to determination, and it's up and down? And later on, the the leaders enslaved fellow Jews, and so anger, he he definitely had anger issues. He he grabbed a guy by the hair and pulled him, you got to get right with God, I'm not there yet. But I haven't been there yet. We'll see. I, I don't, I'm not going to speak through the future there. But what are you doing? Uh, people, just, let's just face it. This is life. It's just ups and downs and all over. And our emotions can change during the day. And different things come up in our lives. Uh, when we ha- we're called to do the job. And he was called to build a physical city. But we believe everybody's created for a purpose. Uh, we, one of our core values is every believer's a minister. Every one of you are a minister. Now, I'm a pastor, but everybody's a minister. Whether you go abroad, like we just prayed for El Salvador, or, we, or Guatemala, or here, whether we minister here. Every one of us are a minister. So there's some area of some building or something that we're called to build And it's not necessarily a physical house, a physical building, where we're supposed to create some kind of bridge where someone can encounter Jesus. And God says he has given you, in Hebrews chapter 13, he's given you everything you need to be able to do that. If he calls you to something, it's usually beyond your ability anyway. It's always beyond us. But then he empowers us to be able to do it. I mean, the, the disciples never left Galilee And some of them went to India. Some of them went to Ukraine. Some of them went to Ethiopia. They scattered around the world because God empowered them 
to be able to do more than they were able to do on their own. Okay? And so there is that. Now, Nehemiah is a book, but just because it's a book in the Bible, there are other books that were written about the same time. And as you lay these books on top of each other, you begin to get a story. So Nehemiah is there. We've mentioned Ezra. So if you read both those stories, they both are pieces of a puzzle. You put it together and you get a bigger picture of what's going on. There's another book in the Bible. It's called Haggai. Haggai, a third person that's there at this time. You got Nehemiah, Ezra, and Haggai all talking. They were friends. They knew each other, okay? And so where we are in Nehemiah is the walls are built, but the city's not built. There's no houses in the wall. There's, you got a wall, and everybody's living in a tent. And so what they encouraged everybody to do is it's time to build the houses. It's time to get that going, okay? And so they start to build the houses. They start to build the temple, and Haggai steps in. All right? So this is what's happening. In Haggai chapter 1, verse 3, then the Lord sent this message to the prophet Haggai. Why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? This is what the Lord of heaven's army said. Look at what has happened to you. You have planted much but harvested little. You eat but are not satisfied. You drink but are still thirsty. You put on clothes but cannot keep warm. Your wages disappear as though you're putting it in your pockets filled with holes. So here's what happened. We need a temple. We need homes. They were enthusiastic. They started building the temple. And then they started working on their homes. I don't think they intentionally decided one day, yeah, let's just forget the temple. We're done with the temple. But somehow in there, building their homes started to consume them, and building the temple became less and less a priority. And now Haggai comes out and says, do you realize what's happening? We're no longer concerned about the temple. We're concerned about our own lives. And now the temple's starting to fall into ruin, and the results of that, he kind of shared. What does that have to do with us, a temple? Temple really kind of in our day, is not a building of a church. I'm not talking about building a building of a church. I'm talking for us, as I said earlier, the first thing of a temple is a place where people can encounter Jesus. Okay, we got to be consumed with the, the idea that people are not in relationship with Jesus, and we have to be consumed with that. And then the second area of a temple is our own bodies ourselves. The Bible says our bodies are a temple of the Lord. So if people are going to encounter Jesus, how many know I have to have an encounter with Jesus? Because I can't give to anybody what I don't have myself. I can't share that there's joy in your, for you if I'm not experiencing joy. I can't experience, tell other people about peace if I'm not experiencing peace. And so God wants to do something in me so he can work through me. If he does something in me, he can work through me. Two temples. When he works through me, there's a temple. And he works in me, there's a temple. So as I said, the bad is not necessarily building our homes, but building our lives. It's not that I don't want Jesus to be a priority in my life, but how many know he can get crowded out of my life? Now, you're talking to us. We're here on Sunday. I'm not talking Sunday morning. I'm talking Monday afternoon at 3. How many know he can get crowded? Now, are you going to look at 3 tomorrow? Oh, man, I got to have time with you. How many know he can get crowded out? And it's not that every thought has to be about Jesus every moment of every day. And I don't think that the people that started rebuilding Jerusalem intended to ignore the temple. But over a process of time, suddenly the priority of the temple fell down and the priority of my life began to consume me. And let's face it, people, that's a battle we all go through every day. Life consumes us. And I want Jesus to be an authority. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then everything else will fall into place. But how many know he's not always the first thing we seek? He's not the priority in our life. Now, my wife helped me a lot with this sermon. She gave me a line from a woman called Christine King. 
And what she shared in there is Christine Kane shared about how mass information, our bodies weren't intended for mass information that comes today, that we're able to instantly see that there's a tragedy in the Philippines. And I'm like, oh, and grief overload can just overwhelm our lives. So she shared that story, and I thought, man, I got to find some more information about that. So I started researching Christine Kane, and I found this thing that she talks about. It's called the hyperlinked life. The hyperlinked life. And this is how it's defined in the hyperlinked life. What happens is when media was created, and I don't care what media was, I don't care if you gave a message to a runner and they had to run 26 miles, which was the start of the marathon, to give a message. The idea of the message is I have a message for someone, and I want to get it to as many people that they would all know what's happening. There's this thing called newspapers that were created. They, they, they left black stuff on your fingers. You know, they're, they're, they're relics in libraries now, which is another relic. But, you know, these things are out there. Because the idea was there. Uh, news used to just be at 5.30 Central Time. And everybody went on the news at 5.30 to watch it. There were no 24 hours. I know, this is ancient history for some of you. You're going to want to write this down. It will be on the test. You couldn't just turn on the channel or on your phone because there was this mass communication, but here's what begins to happen. A hyperlink thing is it's no longer a mass message. The message is now targeted specifically for one person. They try to bring all this information down and bring it to an avenue that you like. What does that mean? In other words, if you look up certain types of news articles, guess what will be on your feed? Those news articles. You know how this is. It happens. Just research something on the internet and then look at all the ads that are all over any other page you go. I mean, you can look up mattresses and instantly every advertisement is a mattress. They have wired this thing to hyperlink everything to you and make it all about you. How remember, now this is history. You don't have to lift your hand. I don't want young people to see all the old people. But I remember having to do something called math. And they would have this test where in one minute you had to work all these problems and how many of them can you get through? You know what that's like when there's five seconds left. You just write numbers and hope that one of them will be right. Hey, ah, finished! Because the teacher said, you will not always have a calculator with you. Uh-huh. Yeah, I do. I got it with me. But how many know even a calculator? I was helping my daughter with her uh, taxes last year. And I was saying, I'm not doing them for you. I want you to do it. And I gave her two numbers, just uh, 829 minus 537. And so she pulled out her phone. I go, good. She knows how to do it. She punched it. What's 825 minus 537? <laughs> and I said, you aren't even going to punch the numbers? And I said, uh. And she goes, uh. <laughs> There's my answer. I go, you don't even punch numbers anymore. Man, I remember the old days, you had to use your thumb and press a five if you wanted a five. <laughs> it's crazy how these things go, and it's all about us. And how, how many remember something called emails? They're too slow anymore. It's got to be texty. And if I send a text and you don't respond to me within a few minutes, what's wrong? If you're a mom, you know that they flipped over in their car and they're burning if they don't respond. That's the only alternative. <laughs> and then you can tell if they even read it. You read it. You know it's there. <laughs> respond. You know, the, the instant connection that is available to us. Half the people in a survey said this. And I was so convicted. I, I'm trying to do it. I, I, I succeed. I, I worked on this like a week and a half ago. So that gives me 10 days. And I succeeded three of those 10 days. But this is me. I'm one of those half people. The first thing I look at when I wake up is my phone. The last thing I look at before I go to bed, my phone. <laughs> three out of 10 days, I'm trying to break this hyperlinked <laughs> thing in my life. And how does Hagee I describe it? You can't get warm. Your wages seem to disappear. You drink and you're still thirsty. People, I don't think he's talking about just getting warm. and that. He said, nothing in your life is satisfying. 
We have all this available to us and nothing satisfying. People, what's more satisfying on your birthday, getting 150 happy birthdays from people you don't even remember why they're your friends or maybe even going out for a real meal with one person that's a friend? Which one would be more satisfying? But we get this pseudo idea of our importance and the society's there in front of us bringing it. And what I've entitled the next point is just God's in our lives with the God being a little G. The Bible speaks so much, people, about bowing to other gods, and it's hard to relate to that in our own lives. I was able to go to China, and I went into a, a Buddhist temple, and there's Buddha sitting there, not the fat little happy guy. He's evil, angry looking in their temples, and they're leaving food and money and burning things in front of them, and they're literally bowing and praying to a rock. And I'm like, hmm. Believing that rock is their hope. And trying to relate to that in our own life. Well, I wouldn't do that. I don't even have a Buddha in my house or anything like that. People, the gods in our lives, when the Bible talks about gods, it talks about a little word, antichrist. And antichrist means things instead of Christ that we begin to bow to. Going back to Nehemiah, Nehemiah left Jerusalem and went back to work for the king. And then a number of years later, he asked, can I go back and just see how Jerusalem's doing? The king allowed him to do that. When he went back, there was an antagonist against Nehemiah's whole life named Tobiah. Tobiah fought against Nehemiah. He was an evil man. He acted like he was one of them, but he was knifing people in the back. And when Nehemiah got back, he went to the temple because during his absence, what Haggai said worked, and they finished the temple. And he went to the temple, and there's this room where they're supposed to have the sacrifices for God. They store those. They didn't have any room for sacrifices for God because they allowed Tobiah to live in the temple. Tobiah was an antagonist, hated Jerusalem, hated the building of the temple, hated everything, and somehow he moved into the temple. People, how does that happen? How does that happen that we allow things that are anti-Christ, anti-God to move into our temple? And they have a place there and they're rooted there. And it can be some of the smallest things or some of the biggest things. Well, this was a great movie. Yeah, there is a pornography in it, but hey, it's the way it is. It was still a good movie. We allow these things to creep into our lives. In Nehemiah, realized that there was no time to sacrifice for God. <laughs> In the middle of this thing, Haggai said, do you realize everything that you're doing no longer brings us satisfaction? Yeah, we have highs and lows. We have the highs, and we live those highs. Man, wasn't this incredible? We got one of the greatest highs coming up in Wisconsin deer hunting next week. And I'm not speaking against, don't worry, I'm not speaking against deer hunting. <laughs> But people, what we do is we live from high to high to high with no real satisfaction because we get through this and then, well, now Christmas, but what do you do with the 20 days between them? Ugh, we endure. And then we got Christmas. Then we endure. And then there's Groundhog's Day. And then we endure. <laughs> you know, and these things come up in our lives, people, and we just endure everything else and we live for the high points and what God's sitting there saying, don't you realize there's not a satisfaction in that life? And what does has, or Haggai say? Verse 7 of chapter 1. This is what the Lord of heaven's army says. Consider your ways. Stop and think that possibly there may be a problem. Possibly there may be a crowding out of my passion for Jesus because, and I, I'm focusing on a hyperlink life, because I'm spending so much time on the phone, on the internet, that I don't have time to pray and build the relationship with Jesus. Stop and consider that possibly a Tobiah has moved into my life. The Bible says in uh, Ephesians that the devil through anger can get a foothold. Possibly there's a foothold in my life. And the Bible says we just have to stop and consider that possibly this is talking about me today. 
Stop and consider that possibly this has happened. Have I gotten so busy working on my house, working on my life, that I forget that there's a temple that God may want me to do? That I get so busy walking through the routine of my life that I forget that, wow, I see somebody, instead of thinking that maybe this is a God encounter, I should talk to him, I go three aisles down this way because I don't have time to have a conversation. <laughs> And we wear our busyness like a badge. Stop and consider that possibly this is an issue in our lives. Now, you know what, people? Technology. I'm thankful for it. Well, I'm thankful. It's, it's a neutral thing. When the Soviet Union fell 30 years ago, I read a number of articles the last week about the, the Berlin Wall falling and reading articles about that and the, the freedom that came into Eastern Europe. But instantly with that freedom came pornography and they're available to the internet of pornography and how it just started to destroy families. Now people, how many know something like that? It, it's a new, now pornography not, but I'm saying the internet. I, I also went on Wycliffe Bible Translators and by the year 2025, Within five years, every single language is going to have a copy of the Bible available to them to read. We are five years away from everybody having the Bible, and the Bible says when the world has that. Now, how many know technology is incredible? Stop and consider, stop and consider what is happening in your life. So they're stopping and considering. He just... Haggai just kind of opened up his message, ripping into him. Come on, man. What's happening in your life? And then he says this line. Zerubbabel, son of Shekinah, he said this. The Lord your God is with you. God's got a message for you. What was his message? Consider your ways. You're not building the temple like I want. But then here's the encouraging word in there. God is with you. He's not sitting there up in heaven mad. He's with you. And then look what it said he did. So the Lord sparked the enthusiasm of Zerubbabel. He sparked something. People, all I can do is make you feel guilty. And that's why I started it, that I did this message 10 days ago, and I've only succeeded in not looking at my phone morning and night, three of the 10. I'm at a war against this. <laughs> and I'm only doing about 30%, which is 5% higher than my GPA. So I am excited about that. <laughs> but God, can you spark an enthusiasm? Something that we've grown so accustomed to, can you spark an enthusiasm in our lives? Something that we see, that we overlook in our lives, that this is just the way people are. Can you spark something in our lives? John chapter 2. The Bible says in verse 13, it was time for the Jewish Passover celebration and Jesus went to Jerusalem. Isn't that why we want a Jerusalem? Jesus, would you visit? Now, I say this all the time, people, that this church isn't the church. This building isn't the church. But how many realize people recognize a building as a place they can encounter God? That's why we're renovating the Chippewa Falls building. Within a couple months, we're hoping to be in there. That's why we're praying for our Mondovi. God, where are we supposed to meet? we got to have a building, some place that people can connect to. But the whole idea is that, Jesus, would you walk into our temple? And look at Jesus walked into the temple, and he saw merchants selling cattle and sheep and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers of table exchanging the foreign money. Stop and consider the ways. They had grown so accustomed to it that they no longer saw it. And then the Bible says, <laughs> he grabbed a whip with some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. 
He drove out the sheep, the cattle, scattered the money changers, coins over the floor, and turned over their tables. I had to work in a dairy farm one afternoon, one afternoon in my life of dairy farming, and that was plenty. You people that do it morning and night, wow. One afternoon. You know why I quit? The cows came in, and they were supposed to go in their stall, and I was standing in front of the stall that the cow was supposed to come in. And it just started pushing me right in. That thing weighed like over 300 pounds. <laughs> I pushed it on the nose, and it, the, the battle was over. It just ran me over. And the guy said, man, all you got to do is hit it on the nose. I, I don't want to hurt. A, you can't hurt. Hit it and move it. And he came with all his effort, and he moved that cow out so I didn't die. <laughs> That's the one afternoon I dairy farmed. He pushed it. Why am I saying that? He used all his effort to push it. Jesus drove out every cow. Picture what that scene was like. Cows running everywhere. Chickens flying through the air. I never worked a chicken farm. I'm open for an afternoon of that someday. <laughs> he drove them out. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. People, don't be for sale. We're the father's house. We're the temple of the Lord. Don't be for sale. Don't be for sale. And then when the disciples saw this, they said, they remembered that the zeal of the Lord would consume him. What did God spark? Zeal. God, can you spark a zeal like you did to Jesus? That there's things in my life that are not pleasing to you, uproot them. God, there's areas that things have moved into my life, uproot them. If I become so hyperlinked, I'm no longer linked to you, consume them. Father, we are in desperate need today. Why is this so important? One more thing out of Haggai. Haggai went on to say, this is what the Lord says. I will shake all the nations, and the treasures of all the nations will be brought to this temple. And I will fill the place with the glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. A shaking. Now, people, we're already in the shaking. You have to be ignorant not to know that the nations are shaking. Hundreds of missiles can be flown at Israel to blow up the country, and nobody says a thing. But one missile comes out of North Korea and invades Japanese airspace, and the whole world is up in arms because the nations shake. And there's a shaking, but you go, I don't care about the nations. Let's go back to the roller coaster. A shaking can happen really easy. You're high, and all of a sudden, anguish hits, and fear, and doubt, and we are all over the place, and that is called life. It's called life. It's impossible to make sense of chaos. And a shaking will come. And God will shake. But then he says this, but when the shaking comes, the glory of the Lord will come and his treasures will come into his temple. What is his temple? Right here. People, when the shaking happens in your life, it's not supposed to shatter us. It's supposed to be a place where the glory of the Lord will come in and his treasures of peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, long-suffering will come into our lives. God, that you'd be able to plant those things into my life that they become important and consume me. But how many times are we shattered? Why? Because I'm hyperlinked to everybody else and I forgot my link to Jesus. I'm more desperate to go online and say, pray now, no details, and everybody pray, sending thoughts, sending prayers to you. Why would I send prayers to you? I want to send prayers to Jesus. I can't imagine sending prayers to you are going to help you anyway. Can't sit in my dining room going, Egh. God Almighty, are we linked? Stop and consider your ways to clean. The key point here God wants a clean temple. 
Nehemiah stated nine times what got him through that roller coaster. Nine times in the book of Nehemiah, he says this line, God remembers. I'm going through it, but God remembers. Everybody's getting money, and I'm not getting paid, but God remembers. Everybody's enslaving everybody else, but I'm not, but God remembers. The enemies are coming against me, and I should stand up to them and say, this isn't right. But he said, I don't care. God remembers. Hagia, I said, remember this one thing. The Lord is with you today. And he wants to spark an enthusiasm that one more time the temple would be cleaned. And the glory of the Lord would show in this temple. And somebody would come up and say, how are you holding together? Well, it's not Jack Daniels, people. It's a peace of God that overcomes. And Peter says, the comfort you receive in your trials, you in turn will give to others. The comfort you receive, you in turn will give to others. Sometimes people, we got to toss Tobias out. Even if it's only three out of 10 days, don't stop. <laughs> Keep striving. My wife's so much advanced on this. She woke up this morning. This is another story toward her. About three o'clock in the morning, she was talking in her sleep. Woke me up. You know what she was doing? Three in the morning. I didn't even tell her this yet. This is a surprise to her. This is the privilege of being a pastor's wife. She never knows what's coming out of my mouth. She was praying in the Holy Spirit at three in the morning. Just praying in her sleep. I'm like, ah! <laughs> I should be like that. So I stayed up the rest of the night to see if I talked in my sleep. I don't. Consider your ways. Maybe, people, it's not cutting off internet or anything. Maybe it's just a Sabbath from something. A set-aside Sabbath. From 7 to 10, nothing. From 4 to 3, whatever. A Sabbath to consider my ways. And God, you are with us, sparking enthusiasm. Here's how I want to close. Can we just present ourselves to him one more time? We got leaders. If they prepare communion and take it around, it's a way for that we're going to dip in juice. It's going to be all over in different areas. Just dip in and say, God, I am in need of you. I am in need of you. Spark and enthusiasm. God, all I can do is feel guilty. And if I feel guilty, I'll start on the temple and life will crowd you out again. You've got to clean the temple. You've got to drive these things out. But God is with us. God is with us, people. We're going to worship just for a few minutes and I would encourage as many people that want, let's just stand before God present ourselves one more time. If you want to come forward, I encourage as many people that want to come forward. We're just going to sit there and say, God, man, you are with us in Ezra, in Nehemiah, two different times. All Israel just came before the temple and worshiped him. They just left everything and said, God, one more time. One more time, God. May you come upon us. God, we are in need. I speak over you now. God is with you. He will bless you. He will keep you. His grace, His countenance, His presence will rise up within you. He will surround you left and right with the armies of God. He will clean you. He will make you who He wants you to be through the power of Jesus. Because He loves you. Go in the presence and power of God. If you want to come up, God bless you. Come on up. Buy some shoes. Have a great day. Thank you for coming.